Okay. I said I was going to celebrate with a glass of champagne. And uh, I'm here to help Elisa celebrate this fantastic, wonderful achievement that has taken her so many countless hours of very tedious, painstaking work of placing almost 50,000 <laughs> little pieces together to form this gorgeous reproduction of Vincent Van Gogh's uh, painting irises. And so uh, we're here now to celebrate her achievement and we're celebrating with Champagne. Champagne. And we're celebrating Vincent and his beautiful irises. Congratulations, my love. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. I know you love Vincent. I love you. I know. But <laughs> I love you too. But why is he one of your favorite artists? Uh, Van Gogh is uh, a very fascinating artist to me. Um, I saw an exhibition of his portraits at the Philadelphia Museum of Art about uh, 20, 25 years ago. And uh, I was struck by uh, the sheer uh, output. Uh, my understanding is he only painted for 10 years. And mm. what I saw, the portrait exhibit, was a small um, portion of his actual output because he also did landscapes and other things. Mm -hmm. And I just was blown away at how many just unbelievable paintings of, of, of people, portraits that he had done. And uh, of course, uh, I'm also drawn to Vincent Van Gogh uh, because of uh, his life was one where uh, he was tortured and he uh, had no support uh, or, or love from the art community. And he never sold a painting in his whole entire lifetime. He was supported uh, financially in a large part by his brother Theo. And so uh, I identify with uh, the struggle, man's struggle to, uh, I mean, to survive for one, but Vincent struggled for his own sanity. And in the meantime, he created such beautiful, beautiful, beautiful works of art. Mm -hmm. And it's just heartbreaking to know that they only, the world only valued them long after the creator of those works was gone. Isn't so that that's sad. Right sometimes though. Mm. Yeah. So you know what I love about this? And um, you know, I, I started, I believe in the lower left-hand corner and worked my way over to the right, much like the way that you read left to right. And then when I got midway, I had to turn it around. I had to turn it upside down. And walk the other way. I started to remember our trip to the Barnes Museum. Mm -hmm. And I... He had really, a few Van Goghs in there, didn't he? He did. The, my, my favorite. You know what my favorite is? Um, sunflowers? No, that's my mother. Starry Night? No, nope, that's you. <laughs> uh, El Postino? The, the, the Postman. The Postman. I love The Postman. I love him. I love his face. I love the backdrop with the flowers in the background. And I love his little uniform. I love his face. I love everything. It's, it's interesting, Van Gogh's, um, it's almost a sort of to a signature palette of his, the blues and the yellows. Like he well, seemed came, to love blue came, and yellow. That came from his time in Paris. Yeah. He always uh, went back to that color combination. That's interesting that you picked that out. Well, and it's interesting that uh, the postman back then wore an outfit that was predominantly blue with yellow in it. And so it, you would think that he was drawn to the postman, like who is a metaphysical person, an entity, and a uniform that exists. You would think that Vincent was drawn to it simply because the postman was wearing the colors that Vincent oh, already liked to use. I don't know a lot about that painting. Well, I, I don't know either. I, like I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't pretend to know a lot about. Uh, I know that this mm -hmm. one, I thought he did before he was institutionalized, but he, this was the first painting that he did uh, while he was um, institutionalized because they had a garden. So I wanted to ask you, 
because when I was learning about this painting, or little bits and pieces and facts of it, there's one white iris right here. There's only one white iris? What's he, all the blue flowers? No, whether he did that intentionally? Well, the painting is called irises. If the painting is called irises, why is there only one iris? Well, the or painting, they're, all irises. they're all irises. Oh, but, but there's only one white. One, what, and, and what was interesting about this painting too is that every petal that he painted was different. I, I think the white iris is obviously clearly symbolism. It is symbolism, whether it's, whether it's consciously understood by the creator or just a subconscious uh, manifestation of uh, perhaps, you know, uh, I would expect Van Gogh uh, to be a man who felt alien, foreign, misunderstood, uh, not like the rest of the people, his brother is successful, not like the rest of the people are happy and have love and have families and wives. And so I would, I would think this, the white, simple white iris represents himself. Uh, the, uh, and it's, it's, you know what else is interesting too, while I'm looking at this, all the irises are pointing this way. Yeah, sure. Because and he, he, he's the white he iris is, yeah, and, and the rest okay. of the world is all staring at him. He always probably felt uh, like you know, like he didn't well, there fit is in. A few that are pointed to no, I think I think Van Gogh probably felt he didn't fit in. He felt strange and alien. He felt like a stranger in a strange land, even when he was at home and in his own neighborhood. And so, I think that uh, his his uh, his 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 view of himself and his view of the world. Um, are, well, he painted like 143 paintings in a year. Yeah, it's incredible. He, he, he did yeah, this in, the output is incredible. How yeah. how how many great it, just in the year that he was institutionalized, they allowed him to go into the garden when he was able to go into the garden. It, it, <laughs> so it, it, there's there's 52 weeks in a year, and he painted 143 or 148 paintings. That's three paintings a week in in a year. Three paintings a week. It's that, when that he was able productive the 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 productivity the output. Of, of, of creating things is just staggering to me. I think that um, it, it's not just, you know, th these are not blobs of, of, of color on a, on, a, oh, yeah. on, a, on a canvas like your, your kid does on construction paper that you put on your refrigerator. He produced three paintings per week uh, at, at an incredible artistic uh, ability and uh, Again, he's, it's such a tragic story. I'm getting teary. Uh, Van Gogh's life. I'm getting, I'm actually, and, and I, do you get emotional? I, I know one of the first conversations that you and I had, because we've known each other forever, but when we really started to get to know each other, one of the first conversations that we had was about art. And it was art that was in, in my home that we were talking about. Yeah, that painting, that big painting that you had on the wall. That was in Dr. Matei's office. Mm -hmm. That made its way to me. And then somehow I freaky. think... It was, in, it was actually in a flea market, and um, I, I, I couldn't believe that that painting that hung over my desk for years that I worked in his office was in a flea market. I think that you're... And it made its way back to me. I think your affinity for art tends more to the visual and the painting, whereas... Uh, my affinity for art tends more towards literature and words. And so I believe soon after this, we pivoted to um, Daniel Keyes' story, Flowers for Algernon. Oh, yeah. And then also Jack Finney's A Missing Persons. Yeah. And so I think that um, well, let's not forget we, both have, we both have an artistic <laughs> uh, affinity, but I think they're, they're, they're different in that. I, I tend to be more about words and and i I'm, I'm more interested in language words narrative story whereas yours tends to be more perceptual right. painting again you know a, a picture's worth a thousand words i mean you know you, you you your um sensibility is more towards visual and uh and you know painting whereas uh I can appreciate these things, but uh, I, I tend to gravitate more towards uh, literature and story. Because but you did enjoy the Barnes Museum. 
Oh, fantastic. It's amazing. Fantastic. I have to do a collage of the Barnes Museum and all the... We couldn't even take it all in. We really couldn't. It's a lot. And, and the, the, the other thing about the Barnes exhibit is, uh, you know, uh, Barnes is so much more than, than uh, a collector of art. Uh, as in that, you know, art museums, Philadelphia Art Museum, New York's, Paris, you know, they have their own sort of... Uh, way of thinking and, and, and presenting art. And Barnes did not agree with it. Uh, you'll, you'll, if you right, right. remember Barnes' yes. stuff, he had, he, he, had, he had all kinds yeah. of things grouped together. And, and he, he did that on purpose. And he wanted the viewer to take in his collection in exactly the way he presented it. That's right. And, I, and although there is certainly an element of curating done by art museums, it's it's to me a much more primitive method than Dr. Barnes's method of presenting his artworks. Mm -hmm. The other thing about Barnes, of course, which I absolutely love and identify with, is that uh, he, he was uh, he was an iconoclast, and he he was he was he was literally against everything. The modern art world stood for. He made his own judgment, yeah. and he and he collected works that the art world said were worthless. That they're not, yeah. they're not valuable. And he ended up amassing yes. the greatest private, private art, collection, art collection, and they wanted it. Right. They wanted it they in wanted the worst it. way, yeah. and they got it. And they, they got stole it. it from him. They got it. They stole it from him. The Art of the Steel is a great um, video, but maybe you'll join me when we do the uh, Barnes Museum, and uh, we're going to wrap it up. Um, thanks. No. Thanks for joining us. Here you go, babe. Thank you for your input. Click. Slow it again. Congratulations, Alisa. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent.